Okay, well, thank you very much for the invite to talk today about Cardiff University Biobank. I might refer to it as Cardiff University Biobank, or I might refer to it as CUB, uh, because we often call it CUB because it's a bit easier to say. So as mentioned, my name is Phil Stevens, Professor of Cell Biology at Cardiff University. And my role in, in Cardiff University Biobank is as the academic lead. But before I tell you about the biobank itself, I want to tell you a little bit about the context in which we're operating within Wales, which I guess is similar to the context that lots of people operate in across their own, across their own countries. So really what we'd like to do, well beyond the time that I'll be working, um, but it's really to try to collect samples across a life course, so longitudinal sampling. So being able to take samples from healthy volunteers, be they sort of uh, infants or children or adults, but then individuals will go on and develop a disease. So collecting pre-treatment samples, post-treatment samples, there may, be, there may be a relapse of that disease. So we want to collect those samples and eventually we all die, of course. So we want to collect post-mortem samples. So the idea is to have this, as I said, a time course of samples that are collected, which will be so useful for research. And a key under, underpinning part of that is the Cardiff University Biobank, which I'll talk about in a minute. But there's across the university here at Cardiff, there was a whole bunch of other biobanks, uh, an acute myeloid leukemia biobank, the, the Archie Cochrane, which is an infection biobank, a tooth bank, there's a kidney bank, a cancer biobank, a neurosciences bank, and a fetal tissue bank. And basically, it's to coordinate all the activities of these. These ones are in red here because these have already been integrated into CUB, and I'll talk a bit about that later on, but these ones are standalone tissue banks. And the whole point, obviously, is to work with researchers to provide them with the samples, the biosamples that they need. It's about also us being strategic in the selection of the projects that we work on. We can't work on everything. We can't collect every tissue. So we do have to think about what we want to do going forward. It's about biosample provision, but also linking into the wider structures across the university in terms of sample processing. Of course, it's about quality, and also we should measure our performance at the end of the day. So the whole point is that the biobanks at Cardiff University fit into other collections across Wales, other biobanks, such that we can work towards all Wales biobank for the population of Wales, where there's sort of centralized governance, we can link up samples across different databases, uh, different biobase, uh, biobanks, for example. It's about consenting and how we can do that best across the country. It's about linking into our clinical data resources. We have two big centers in Wales, one called the National Data Resource and one called the Secure Anonymized Information Linkage Database, which is held at Swansea University. But it's also about in the future linking to output data. So it's great having the biosamples, it's great having the clinical data, but can we link that to genomics data, proteomics data, scan data, for example? So this is the bigger picture we're working towards in Wales, and I'm sure it's the same in, in most other countries. So what is Cardiff University Biobank? Where does it, where does it fit in? Well, the biobank um, is actually a purpose-built facility. Um, it's 1.6 million pound invested by Cardiff University, and it's situated at the University Hospital of Wales in Cardiff. Uh, and very importantly, um, our key partner in this venture is Cardiff and Vale University Health Board. So that's our national health service partner, our hospital partner, essentially. And we've got, um, I said it's a very, it's a new facility, and it created a couple of years ago. Um, in theory, we've got, we've got storage for 1 million biological samples. We obviously never want to be storing one million biological samples because we want to bring them in and we want to get them out the door into the researchers labs. We also have some dedicated lab space so we can do some processing of samples, processing of bloods through the blocks. And we also have a phlebotomy suite um, where we can take blood from healthy volunteers, which is proving more and more popular. And I'll come back to that later. And essentially what CUB is there to do, it's to underpin the existing biobanking activity across the university. So as I said, some of them we've integrated into the biobank. Others are still standalone, but we're there to help them if they need help in the future. It's about collecting new samples, of course, as well. Um, but it's also about coordination of governance. Because we had 
eight different fire banks across the university, there was eight lots of governance. So what CAB has enabled us to do is to try and coordinate and centralize that governance. And so we opened in 2018. The, the, the business case was approved by the university in 2015. So by the time we went through that process and we actually built the facility, it was October 2018, it was, it was launched. It was launched then, or was opened then by Vaughan Gethin, who was the Welsh Minister for Health and Social Services in the Welsh Government. So we haven't been going very long, as Constantina said about his biobank. Um, and of course, we've had COVID in the middle of that. So it's been a, it's been a challenging time. Uh, but an interesting time nonetheless. So what's our vision? Our vision, just like many other biobanks, of course, is to be a, a world-class biobank, internationally recognised for the timely provision of human tissue biosamples, but also data, clinical data, and maybe output data eventually, for impactful research that makes a positive difference to the health of the global population. And our mission is very much to optimise the legally compliant supply of new and existing collections of human biosamples and linked data to underpin academic and commercial research investigations. So we're very, very conscious that we need to, <clears throat> excuse me, not just support academic endeavours, but also commercial investigations too. This is our, our structure. This is me. I'm the CUB academic lead. We have a CUB manager, Kate Shires who's been um, instrumental in the designing the biobank, but also runs it on a, on a daily basis. We have a Gov, CUB governance and strategic advisor. It's my, my colleague, Karina Fraser, who I worked with quite, quite uh, intensively in terms of the original business case. We have a quality manager, we have administrative support, and we have technical and biobank officers, which actually go out and interact with the researchers and they bring in samples, they store the samples, they send the samples out. So it's not a huge team, but it's, it's a very effective team. In terms of the wider structure, we have a CUB operational team and a CUB quality group. Feeding into that is the CUB scientific review committee, and I'll come back to that in a minute. We also have a CUB steering committee. <clears throat> we have a group of individuals who look at what we've done throughout the year and they make suggestions to what we should be focusing on going forward. And then all of this fits into the wider university um, structures. There's the college structure in terms of the Human Tissue Standards Committee, and then it goes up into the university structure and eventually feeds up into the highest level of governance, which is the University Governance Committee. So there's tight control and oversight of what we do. I mentioned quality and our quality manager is Kieran O'Sullivan. He's been doing a great job. Just as Constantina said, we have ISO 9001 certification as well. We've just been recertified actually. And it's obviously very much about control documentation in terms of standard operation procedures, being consistent and relevant to what we're doing. It's about oversight of the equipment and the facility in terms of calibration, monitoring, so things are accurate and reliable. It's about continual improvement. We can all do things, we can all do things better. So we look at our non-conformances, we have extensive audits so we can improve quality and be efficient. And it's very much about the personnel, making sure that they're competent, making sure they're well-trained, so they're competent and confident to deliver their role. In terms of traceability, when we set up the Biobank, we were looking at a number of different limb systems we did consider creating our own, but then realized it was so complicated, we needed to buy one off the shelf. And we looked at a number of different systems, but for us, LabVantage has been really, really good. It's a good system for us. It can, we can track requests, biobanking, management, storage, et cetera. But the good thing about it is that it's, it's adaptable. We bought it off the shelf and it did most of the things that we wanted, um, but we, then, we were then able to work with LabVantage to tweak it so that it fitted our specific requirements. And we can make minor tweaks ourselves, which is, which is really useful. But if we require <clears throat> a major tweak, then of course we can go to LabVantage and they'll do that for us. In terms of searching for samples, at the moment, we, we obviously have our, our database and we know what's on it and people approach us and we discuss what's, what's on it and we can provide lists of what's on it. But we're in the process of developing a new sample search system. You can see that in front of you. So it's a web-based system. It links to LabVantage. It links to all our samples. And people will just be able to go onto the website 
and they'll be able to search on sample types, tissue types, sample uses, etc. You know, if there's any restrictions on any samples, they're maintained through this. Uh, and so this is going to be a sort of a, a great way forward and a, a much better way for us to interact with our with our customers, if you like. Uh, we're hoping to get this live uh, in the new year, in the first couple of months of the new year. Um, and so, yeah, so this is this will be a good resource going forward. In terms of what we provide, well, we can obviously provide stored samples. We have a number of collections of fixed and frozen samples. You can see here we have a large liquid nitrogen storage uh, system, which is automatically fed. We have 12 minus 80s. We can sort minus 20 at room temperature. So lots of stored samples. But we can also provide fresh samples. And this is becoming more and more important for researchers who need to get hold of tissue, especially blood products, quite quickly. So we can work with people. We can, we can consent. We can get those tissues come into the biobanks. They can be logged, anonymized, and they can be out to the researcher within a matter of hours, which some people really appreciate. And so, in, in terms of our services, we can people can access samples. We have samples stored already from various collections, and I'll cover that in a minute. Um, but what we've also done quite a lot of recently, and it's becoming very popular, is new prospective collections. So working with researchers, often clinical researchers, to set up bespoke collections for them. Um, well, for them and for others, that others can tap into it as well. Um, and these, as I said, are proving very, very popular. And we're, we're keen to support these because these are samples we know are going to be used. Um, so we're keen on those, on that. We can also undertake sample adoption. Sometimes uh, a biobank is closing and they've got some samples that we don't think should go to waste. The, the patients have been gracious enough to allow us to be custodians of those samples. So it, it would be, uh, it'd be sad to see those samples destroyed. So we can adopt samples from other biobanks. We can also adopt samples from studies that are finishing. Sometimes there are projects, especially across the university, projects that are finishing um, and the, the researcher doesn't know what to do with those samples. So they can come into CUB and they can be advertised and they can be used by researchers across the world. We also undertake sample hosting. We often do this for companies which is just about bringing their samples in. We just look after them for five, 10, 20 years. We can offer some project support and I'll come back to that later on and also data linkage. Of course, there's cost recovery fees associated with this. We do have to try and cover our costs. You know, we are a service for the, for the university and, and out, out with the university, but we do have to generate some cost recovery where we can. So in terms of accessing samples, this is this is the flow. So at the minute, there's um, the, the researcher will, will contact us and uh, try and find out what samples we've got, but eventually we'll have that sample search database in place. The researcher fills out a preliminary application form that comes into us. Um, we often uh, spend a bit of time with them talking about what they actually need, because sometimes what they think they need is actually not what they actually need. Um, so sometimes that's a preliminary application and the request for samples changes. But eventually a full application form will come in. We then look at that, we quote, we send that back out to the researcher if they're happy. Then it goes off to our scientific review committee. So our scientific, scientific committee review process um, is a whole bunch of individuals, no one that's actually directly involved with CUB, but there's um, scientists involved, clinicians involved, lay people involved, ethics people involved. Um, and they'll make a decision as to whether that um, application should be supported. It could be, a, it could be an application for a new collection, or it could be an application for access to samples. If it's approved, then depending on who it's with, then we either set up an MTA or an MOU, that's all signed and the samples can be released. And the beauty of this project, or of, the, of, the, of this approach, I, I, I mean, is that you don't need to go for separate ethical approval. In the UK, it's a very, cumbersome process applying for ethical approval and it means you don't have to go for R&D research and development approval from National Health Service either. And so usually what this means is that the samples are distributed within days of the fee payment or the transfer agreement being signed. And so our current collections, um, I talked about new prospective collections. We have one around cystic fibrosis, adult cystic fibrosis. We're in the process of setting up a paediatric cystic fibrosis. And on the back of the success of those, we're also um, setting up a wider respiratory collection. We have a collection around hydradenitis suprativa, which is a skin scarring disease, which is gaining a lot of interest at the moment through commercial partners. 
We have healthy volunteers, so that, that's blood, um, and we have an increasing demand for this. There's a, a big demand across the university for, for healthy blood. We've got, we started an elite sports collection. We have um, the AML samples, that's one of the biobanks that was integrated. We have the infection trial samples, that's another biobank that was integrated. Um, so we have a, a growing body of collections, and we're always interested to talk to researchers to see what else that they actually need. Samples wise, we're probably heading towards 30,000 samples at the moment. Um, the majority of urine because it's linked to the Archie Cochrane biobank that was integrated. And we have bloods, so we have sputum, serum, some frozen tissue and some, and some skin. So the number of biops, number of samples is going up quite quickly. And what's really pleasing, even though we only started in 2018 and we've had the COVID pandemic in the middle of everything, is that the samples that we've been supplying have already been used for research um, research projects that have now been published. So it's really gratifying to see that publications are coming out supported by the samples that the Biobank has supplied. I mentioned project support. Um, we've got a relatively small team, so we can't do an entire project for people, but we can provide some project support. We can provide help around consenting, of course, the actual select um, sample collection, basic processing. We can process bloods. We can take things through to paraffin blocks. And so we've done this, a small number of studies with a few companies. And we can also undertake temporary storage for, for individuals or organisations. During the COVID pandemic for Public Health Wales, we managed to store about 100,000 of their samples because they ran out of space. Um, so it's good to work with other organisations. And we can arrange for more complex processing through other partners across the university. We have something called the Central Biotechnology Service at Cardiff University that does proteomics analysis, genomics analysis. So we can we can link directly into that. So essentially, we can provide a sort of a, a really good service for researchers from obtaining the tissue through to processing the tissue through to getting genomics or proteomics data. So what's the future? Well, it's strange to talk about the future when we're only a couple of years old, but we have had a, a look back at what we've achieved in the past couple of years, given what COVID has done to, to, to the world. And we now have a new five year plan. Um, a key to that is to launch the new web pages. So we're developing new web pages, updated web pages. But a key part of that is that online service uh, search tool that I talked about earlier on. We too, just like Constantinus, we're working towards the biobanking ISO standard. Um, we are actively working towards that. Whether we'll hold both ISO, uh, ISOs, we'll have to wait and see, um, but we're certainly working towards that. I mentioned at the start that Cardiff and Vale University Health Board was a key partner in working with CUB, um, but in the ethos of trying to develop all Wales biobanking, we intend to work with other health boards across Wales. We obviously want to grow the existing collections. We're really keen on new prospective collections, as I mentioned earlier on. And this is because those collections, as I said, are in demand. They're being driven by active, normally clinical researchers that want those samples, that they know there's a market for those samples. So we're very keen to develop those. We want to increase the healthy blood supply. I said we've got a phlebotomy unit, but that's uh, of limited size. We have limited capacity and that's been, um, we're outgrowing that facility in some respects. So we're going to try and link with the Welsh Blood Service to see if we can get access to blood through to them. We want to increase the hosting services. Hosting is, is a good thing for us to do. It's relatively straightforward. We just look after people's samples. So we want to increase that. And a key part is engaging more with commercial researchers. A lot of the activity that we've been involved in has involved academics, um, academic researchers, clinical and non-clinical, but there has been a growing interest now from commercial researchers and we work with a number of companies throughout, throughout the biobank and so we want to increase that going forward. So that's all I wanted to say. There's our email address, there's our telephone number. If you have any thoughts, if you have any questions, happy to try and answer those now and happy to take um, inquiries through the biobank over the days to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Feld. Uh, really nice presentation. Uh, any questions?
Um, I have a question, if I may. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for a great presentation. And uh, I, I just wanted to ask, um, could you give some um, uh, description of, of some of the kinds of prospective collection that you've uh, that you've set up so far? Um, and um, I, I was um, wondering whether you, you've had any requests for um, uh, collection, prospective collections of, of normal skin, which is something we seem to, to hear quite a lot. Yeah, so, so our, our major prospective collection, new prospective collections, have been around cystic fibrosis. As I mentioned, we've, we've, got, um, we've got quite an established adult collection at the moment. Um, but we're just now going through and, and developing a paediatric collection. Uh, the, the good thing for us in terms of cystic fibrosis is that the centre, or well, the central clinical unit is here in Cardiff, but it's actually an all, it covers all of Wales. So it, it is a bit of an all Wales biobank in, in that sense, which is, which is really nice. Um, and actually from that, what's growing now is a wider interest in respiratory. So it looks as though we're going to, not not through design, but through through need, we're we're, we're moving down the sort of respiratory biobank route, which is which is great. Right. Um, so so that's growing. It's, there's more and more researchers and clinicians that have come on board with that, which is which is really good. So we've got that one. Um, the other one, which is really starting to take off now, is the Hydradenitis Superativa, the HS collection, right. Um, right. which is it's not that common disease. It's it's it could be classed as a rare disease, but it's. It's quite um, de uh, debilitating for, for, for patients. And that's really taken off lately, driven by commercial interest, actually. So right. we have at least two or maybe three commercial um, partners now working on that through a, through a clinician in Cardiff. Um, and we're, we're supplying the samples. And um, they've just employed a, like a, a clinical research fellow to help service that, that demand, which is, which is good. So, so, that's, so that's growing. Um, in terms of healthy skin, we, we have had some inquiries about healthy skin, but we haven't started up um, we haven't started up a prospective collection. But that's certainly something we'd be interested in in talking about because I know, you know, I used to use skin for my own research many many years ago, um, and I know researchers across Cardiff use it. But if there's a if there's a growing need, then that's something we could definitely look to try and develop. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. Th thinking of uh, pulmonary diseases, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis seems to be very, uh, very frequently requested. One as right. well. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, any disease that anyone's got an interest in, if they yeah. if they approach us, we can't always provide the samples. And and for us, I guess the way it's worked is that we really do need an active clinician involved. Um, because they're, they're great at driving this and working across the health board and the university. So um, <clears throat> we'll always be honest, if we can't, if we can't supply the samples, then we, we, we will say, um, but we'll always try and, and help out, even if we can provide one or two samples as part of a, a wider global biobank, if you like, then that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about HS? I mean, you just mentioned it's a rare disease and you know you don't have much samples about it yeah H, um, hs is a is a it's a skin scarring disease and um the patients develop these sort of often under um, armpits and stuff develop these sort of tunnels of scar mm -hmm. tissue um and so it's it's quite debilitating for, for those individuals um and it's i said it is it it, it in some places in the world, it's classed as a rare disease, and others it, it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, you know, for me, my my research background is in skin scarring, actually. Okay. Um, so I've got quite quite an interest in, in this, and I've got quite a I'm quite keen to to support it. Um, mm -hmm. And once again, Cardiff, for, from a Wales perspective, Cardiff is is the hub for for HS clinical activity. So it's sort of an all Wales collection again. So we have a clinician called John Ingram, who's um, very active in this space um, and is very keen to to provide the sample set, not just for his own research, but there's this big clinical interest all of a sudden. I'm not I'm not quite sure why there's a big clinical interest, whether they've got some drugs in, in development they think would be useful against uh, against or useful for HS patients. I'm not quite sure. But whatever it is, as long as we can support research 
which is for for the the benefit of the glo of global health, then that's what we're here to do.